operating system has some built-in controls in it to make sure that your application doesn't freeze up the person's phone, okay? And therefore, if a couple things happen, one of them being if uh, a touch is not responded to within, I think, five second time, and there's another, there's another um, criteria that I don't remember off the top of my head, you will get a message that says, application not responding, ANR. All right, and that's not good. All right, and then the user can either let it ride or the user can force close, halt the application. Ideally, you would never want to see that. All right, now the key to that is understanding threading and understanding <clears throat> what sorts of operations are likely to take a while in computer terms. And the first one of them that we saw were database operations. All right, so in this example, we do some multi-threading and we'll take a look at, at that in a few minutes. We'll take a look at the actual code. Another thing that could be would be some sort of network operation. If you had to, for example, if within your Android application you ran out to the web and fetched something, requested something from a service or, or whatever. That is something that potentially could take too long. If you write your application and you ignore threading, if you write it as a single thread, that kind of thing could hang up a person's phone. Fortunately, the Android operating system will give the user a way out, but still, you don't want your application doing that. You don't want your application crashing and causing um, the system to freeze up and so on. So there's three concepts with regard that, that are very similar, but they are different. And the point of this class is not to uh, become experts in these things, but to understand them. Because I'm not really sure if they're talked about in any other programming class. Maybe the advanced C sharp class? I don't know. The concepts are multitasking. multi-threading and multi-processing. And there's a little bit of mixing and matching um, involved here. Does anyone care to give a definition of any of these terms? Any of them that you're familiar with? Maybe you're not, you're familiar with them. That's why you're here. All right. Back in the old days, a computer did one task at a time. Put in your cards, ran through the card reader, computer did its thing, output the results. You could put in the next job then and do that. That was a single task machine. A computer could do one thing at a time. Now, we know our modern computers aren't like that, right? Because we can be writing a term paper, surfing the web, listening to music, having an Excel spreadsheet open, and so on. And we can do all of these on human terms at the same time, all right? That is known as multitasking. With multitasking, you have a processor, the CPU, of hardware that can handle a bunch of tasks at the same time. And this might be your music player, this might be Excel, this might be Word, this might be Google Chrome, and so on. So all of these are processing at the same time. How, at the same time when we speak on human terms, human scales of time, all right? They actually are not processing at the same time. A single processor machine like that still only processes one task at a time. So in that respect, it's no different than the old days, all right? What's different about it is the operating system, which, by the way, is another task, all right, can schedule.
agile and can time slice and can rotate around the different tasks to give each one of them a little bit of attention. All right. So these tasks, this one will be running, and this one will be running, and this will be running, and this will be running, and they cycle through them, and the operating system actually controls that. All right. And more sophisticated the operating system is, more sophisticated that control will be. All right. But the idea is these tasks are running at the, appear to be running at the same time from a human perspective when really a given process, only one task is running on a processor at a time. So this is multitasking where we have the processor being rotated among several tasks. All right. What is multiprocessing? Well, multiprocessing is where you actually have a couple of processors. And each of these processors can have tasks assigned to it that it rotates among. So you can handle more tasks because you have more processors on the job. And each one of these processors is multitasking. All right. So each one of these processors is only running one thing at a time, but those tasks are being rotated through. All right. And it happens on this one, happens on this one, and therefore you get the illusion that a whole bunch of things are happening at the same time. So that's multitasking and multiprocessing. Multiprocessing sort of implies multitasking. All right? Multithreading implies multitasking as well. All right? Multitasking is like this. Multitasking is where you take one task and break it down into two little itty bitty tasks that each get treated, that each get a section of time. Those itty bitty tasks are called threads. So, let's say we have the Android system. And you know on the Android system, you can be doing many things at, the time, at a time. You can be listening to music. Your email can be running in the background. Your phone is waiting to see if it gets a call. So it's kind of running, monitoring the situation. And then we have your app. And let's, for simplicity's sake, talk about one processor. That processor rotates among these two things. Now, let's imagine that we have a process that a uh, part of our app takes a long time, again, in computer terms, to run. So we get to a section of code that takes a long time to run. While the processor is working on that, the processor can't handle the user input if the user hits a button or whatever. And again, based on the safeguards that are built into Android, if it doesn't respond within a certain period of time, you're going to get the application not responding message, and they can exit out of your application. So here's what gets done. You subdivide this task into threads. This is our app. This is our threads. And our main thread, the thread that we get when we start any app, we typically call the UI thread because that handles the user interface. All right. The other thread are the, are the problem child, problem children. The things are going to take a long time that we can identify. So, for example, database interactivity, or if we went out on the network or whatever to grab some information, or playing a game. Uh, if we look at the Canon game, if not, you can look at it on your own. The things on the screen are moving, but there's
there's a different, but they're moving in a different thread because we don't want to block the fact that the user can aim and shoot the cannon. All right. So with threading, you break down this task into two threads, and these two threads sort of share the amount of time devoted to that task. All right. And in that way, these two things are kind of happening simultaneously or asynchronously. We can't guarantee that they're happening at the, that they're happening together in any fashion. We just know that we can start a thread, it's going to run and then it's going to finish. But with this approach with multi-threading, we can make sure that that UI thread gets the time it needs to do its job and to be responsive for the user. So that's why we're doing all this to begin with. Anything that could potentially hog the processor's time for our application could keep it from being responsive. So therefore, we want to make sure that we always give at least some time to the UI. All right. And then the other thing we can do in another thread. And by that way, we make sure that that doesn't get hung up. So we don't want to do anything too major in the UI thread. And I think if you look at the applications we've done so far, we've done a little bit of math here and there and, and a little bit of data manipulation, but we haven't done anything earth shattering. Nothing that's going to take up like, or nothing that really has the potential of taking up a good amount of time. But when we get into database operations, we are getting something that could potentially run into a little bit of time. So we're going to break that down into a thread, and we're going to start the thread um, and let it run, and then go from there. Now, if you logically take this to the next extreme, if you have multi-threaded multi-processing, then potentially thread could run on, a thread for each task could run on a different processor, I believe, anyhow. And that's where you'd really get some, like, really good performance. That's why, like, when multi-processing machines first came out, it's all well and good, it's more horsepower, but if the apps aren't written in a way to take advantage of that, you know, you don't have as big a gains as you potentially could have. All right, so let's look at the database example, the address book example, to see where multi-threading comes in. And there will be multi-threading there'll be multi-threading everywhere we do a database operation. So we talked about there being five different database things we were doing in this app. We were retrieving a list we were retrieving one specific um, contact. We were inserting, we were updating and delete. Each one of those activities is, a thread is created to do that so we don't block the UI thread. There's some good articles here on the developer.android.com. It's a good site for you to spend some time, good resource. You can't see them, of course, because you're looking at my other screen. All right. This talks in a little more detail about the guards that are in place. You should not perform work, a potentially length, lengthy operation, on the thread that handles the UI. And here's the two, require, uh, the, the two criteria. No response to an input event within five seconds or a broadcast receiver has, hasn't finished executing within 10 seconds. And they talk about some of the things to do in here and they go into more detail. And one of the key things is threading. The message, by the way, looks something like this. Application not responding. Do you want to wait or do you want to clobber it? All right. So let's look at the code for this. 
And we can pick any database function that we do in here. And we might look at a couple of them. Um, but they're all going to look about the same. Let's look at our main activity address book Java is the main activity that starts it will be the UI thread as each of these other activities get invoked they will be the UI thread and within them if we want to do database operations we need to do them in the background so let's find this into text edit so that we can look at more closely the example of creating a thread. All right, so if you remember the first thing that this does is it gets gets the um, list of stuff. All right. This happens on the on resume. So when the application starts up back again, it gets the contacts. And it does it by saying new get contact ta uh, task. So it's going to create an object and it's going to call execute and it's going to pass it no parameters. All right, what is get contact task? It is, it extends async task. All right. By its nature, that means that it is going to have some Part of it is going to run in the background. So, as this is created, we have our database connector object. We then, and again, this fires off because this is part of the framework, we execute this do in background method. So, if we look at each one of these examples of doing database interactivity, we are constantly doing in background. So we have an asynchronous task object. Doing in background is the thing that we are going to do in a separate thread. All right? Thing we're going to do in a separate thread. So what are we doing here? We're opening up our database and we are doing, we we're returning our database connector get all contacts. If you remember from last time, that returns a cursor. A cursor is simply a list of uh, results that are retrieved, a, a list of rows that are retrieved that we can traverse our way through. In this case, it is a, um, because this is a list activity, we can um, set the adapter for the list to the cursor and we get our list of items. So this chunk of code is going to run in its own thread for however long it takes to do it. And because we're running it in the background, our UI thread is still getting its proper attention from the processor. So if we were to interact with the screen while it's retrieving it, well, you know, we're not going to freeze up is still getting the attention it deserves. Now, when this method finishes, the on post execute method will occur. And what does the on post execute method do? Well, it sort of notifies the main UI thread, hey, the database 
operation is done. You can go and do with what you need to do with the results. And what are we doing in this case? We are setting the contact adapter. Effectively, we're setting the contact adapter that's associated with this list. So we are showing the actual contacts in the list. And we, uh, and we close our database uh, connector. All right? So we're going to see this, and we're going to look at the other examples here, all right, to see how this all works together. But each one of these is going to follow, follow this pattern. We're going to have an object that extends the async task object. We're going to write at least two methods, all right? The one method is doing background. The other method is on post execute. Doing background becomes a code that is the actual thread. On post execute is the code is sort of our is sort of the uh, operating system's way of notifying the main thread. Hey, that side thread that you started off is done. So whatever you were asking it for, it's ready. Go and do what you need to do with it. Let's look at other examples, and we'll see that they pretty much fit that mold. Let's look at when we do, when we view a contact. actually has two asynchronous tasks. One to um, one to retrieve the, the contact and one to delete the contact. So if you notice, on resume again, we say new load contact task. So we're creating a new thread object and execute and pass it the row ID. All right. The two methods that we have, do in background, opens up a database connector again, calls a database method that gets one contact and returns that. Finally, when this is done, the return value from this gets posted here. On post execute, we go and do our thing and we populate the text boxes with the values that we pulled from the database. Then we close the cursor and we close our database connection. So when this resumes, so when, the, when it's created the first time and any time it resumes, it will run out, grab the contact that we want, invoke this background process to retrieve it, when that background process is done, then we can go and we can grab from the cursor the first element. Now we know that there's only one element because we're, we're pulling up a specific contact. So we know that for sure that there's only going to be one of them. Delete will work about the same. We have a delete contact method, but notice that this doesn't really do all the work. This does the UI portion of the work. And what's the UI portion of the work from a delete? Well, it is to confirm the deletion. All right. We confirm the deletion, and if they have said they want to delete it, then we go and we create our asynchronous task, 
do in background, and then finally, we're done. Finish closes this task out and takes us back to the previous task that, I'm, I'm sorry, not task, but activity that called it, in other words, the main address book. Last but not least here, in our add, edit, contact. We should have two examples of this, one on the insert and one on the update. Actually, we only have one because we have one save button. The save button is smart enough that when we do our save contact, it decides whether to do an insert or an update. So we, I, I, was, I misspoke. There's only one asynchronous task. That asynchronous task handles both the inserts and the updates, depending on whether it got past a key or not. This is one of those things that really starts to elevate your code from merely code that works to code that is good. You know, you are liable to, if you developed a address book app such as this, or if you developed um, a grocery list app or any sort of app, a to-do list, when you're testing it with five or six items, it might work perfectly good. When someone gets out there in the real world and starts having hundreds of items on their to-do list, though, and the queries start taking longer, and they may have other things installed, different sort of device and all that, they could run the risk of hanging up the application, making it not responsive. So that's where um, it's important for you to sort of plan on any operation that potentially could take long and again in this case it would be um, a database operation and create a another thread for it. I'm going to try to find the Canon application see if I have it here because that would be a good one to compare how it does threading. Let's go and run the app, and I don't know if we're going to cover this app in its entirety, but at least I want to look at the threading part of it, because I think it would be good to reinforce the concept of threading in a, a, a different context.
cannon game. Nice retro game here. We have a cannon. We have our goal is to hit the uh, blue and yellow things. The black thing that goes back and forth is a block. All right. And it gives you 10 seconds to hit as many as you can. So I'm going to try to do this while talking. I hit reset. Yeah, that's nice. Uh huh. Right, right, right. Right. That's like a breakout? What's that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, let's think about this. This game has to do two things at the same time, right? It has to move those guys back and forth. And it should move them smoothly. It shouldn't move them jerky. The other thing is, is it should respond to me firing the cannon and hitting things. Ooh. It's just a dumb game, and I play it like once a day every semester, and it's like still after you do it a while, it's like, I want to get all of them. All right. So there's actually, now that I think about it, there's actually a couple things about this application that are going to be worth exploring. So we will talk about it. Today, I want to focus on the threading aspect of it because we're continuing in that theme. Now, again, if you could imagine, if this is done in one thread, you would have the potential of two different things happening that would be bad. The one thing that would be bad is maybe the moving wouldn't be nice, smooth, continuous. The second issue is that maybe it wouldn't respond to me trying to shoot the cannon. In either case, that wouldn't be good. So therefore, we want to have two different threads. We want to have a UI thread and we want to have um, a thread for the um, a thread for the the the, the motion of the um, the motion of the um, objects on the screen. All right. All right, let's look first of all. There's actually two things at work here. There's the cannon game and the cannon view. All right. The cannon game is the activity. It is going to represent the UI thread here. All right. So. If we just look and see, even without reading the code, but if we read the comments, we can sort of get the sense that this guy is responsible for the UI. here. All right. And that is um, one of the themes, one of the things that they talked about um, in the guideline when we were looking at it about making your app responsive is that your UI thread shouldn't have a lot in it. All right. 
What this is doing is, and we'll go over this more next week, it is handling the UI. In other words, it is handling the touch events. So if the user taps, if the user swipes, if the user double taps, it's handling that sort of thing. So this is strictly handling the user interacting with the activity. The game part happens here. I was getting worried here, I didn't see a thread, but I see the thread now. So. This is a canon view, and the canon view sort of represents the, um, the game board here. Notice that when this starts up, or when one game is finished, this new game method gets called. And again, we are skipping a lot of stuff that we'll come back and cover um, in, in subsequent classes just to get to the threading. The threading is part of the new game. When we start a new game, so sort of between games, where it's displaying that dialogue that says you got so many points, you got whatever, there's only the single thread going. When a game is going on, this thread was created and this thread was started. Let's go down and look at that thread. down here. We have a, an object to manipulate the surface. We have an object that says if the thread is running or not. And effectively what we're doing is as long as the thread is running, it locks the canvas it does some synchronization, and we'll talk about that in uh, a bit. But effectively, what it does is it redraws the canvas. All right, it redraws the canvas. So there's methods in here to draw the canvas. There's methods here to create the um, to create the um, um, barriers that are moving the targets. There's there's methods to move the targets. There's methods to aim the cannon. There's methods to do all those things. But those things are running in a thread, so as to not to interfere with the um, with the um, user interface.
Synchronization occurs with threads occurs when you need to make sure that two things aren't updating the same thing. So you can do some synchronization on the threads to make sure that that surface is locked all right, for a period of time. So that way the two threads can't interfere with each other. Depending on the nature of the threads, if they could possibly butt heads and, and manipulate the same objects or variables, you would want to synchronize it so that um, the one doesn't destroy what the other one is doing. Any questions on this? This is a little bit different. This thread is not a different kind of thread. It's not a asynchronous task. All right. Remember what was key with the asynchronous task is that we define a task, we set it up to run in the background, and then we have some code that executes after it's done. Here, we don't really need to do that. We just need to have this process of the, the objects on the screen moving and the, the screen getting redrawn happen in another thread so as it will not interfere with the, um, the user interface and we won't get the, the application locking up. I do want to go over more of this example um, and I would suggest you download it and take a look at it but I don't think I want to do that today. I don't think we have about a half hour left. I would just as soon give you the time if you have questions to ask on your assignments to do that instead of trying to jump in on this and um, getting only part way through. We'll save this for Monday of next week. Any questions about this? It's important to learn this in concepts. This isn't an Android th thing. All right? It's not even a Java th uh, thing. The idea of threading is something that you run into in many cases and you can create more efficiently running code, code that doesn't lock up the user interface and so on uh, by following these ideas. All right, that's all I had. Rest of the time you may work on your lab assignments.